This is part of a series of videos for a course I'm teaching on introductory proof writing. And here we're gonna look at counting, counting lists and subsets. And this is just to give us like a pretty simple tool to use to write our first proofs in a few more videos. Okay, so let's see the difference between a list of objects slash a sequence of objects, those are kind of synonyms, and sets of objects. So a list of objects has the order of the objects that matters. So in other words, the list given by one, two, three is not the same thing as the list given by three, one, two. And then the list given by one comma one is not the same as the singleton list just given by one, even though we do have repetition of objects here. Whereas with sets, the order of objects does not matter. And so the set containing one, two, three is the same thing as the set containing three, one, and two because they have the same elements. Furthermore, the set containing one and one, well, that's exactly the same thing as the set containing one because it's not like you get two copies of each element. Okay, next we wanna talk about the multiplication principle, which is kind of the building block for all of our counting. And that says that if you're building a list of length n, and there are a i choices for the ith entry, then there are a total of a1 times a2 all the way up to a n lists. So here's an example. So I'm in the state of Virginia in the United States. And so let's do an example on the number of Virginia license plates. So maybe before we dive into it, let's maybe go ahead and point out the standard format of a Virginia license plate. And the standard format goes letter, 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 number, number, number. So I'll just write that like this. So we've got A, B, C, one, two, three, four. Okay, good. So that means you have to choose a letter for the first entry, for the second and third entry, and then numbers for the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh entry. So I wanna do this two times just for illustration. So in the real world, you do allow repetition in these license plates, so it would be possible to have A, A, Q, one, 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 five, even though you've got repetition there. So I wanna do the example with repetition, and then just for the example, I wanna do it without repetition as well. Okay, so allowing repetition, we'll have 26 times 26 times 26 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 total license plates. So why is that? Well, here we've got 26 choices for each of the letters and then 10 choices for each of the numbers, zero through nine. So let's maybe go ahead and point that out that that's just 27 cubed times 10 to the fourth. So you can multiply that out if you want, but it turns out to be uh, 175, 76, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that's kind of a lot, right? So now what about with no repetition? So this isn't a realistic example because repetition is allowed, but you know, it's maybe nice and illustrative. So if there's no repetition allowed, then there are 26 choices for the first letter, but we've already used our first letter. So for our second letter, there are only 25 choices. And then for our third letter, there are only gonna be 24 choices because we've used two letters already. Then the same thing happens with the numbers. So there are 10 numbers available for the first number, nine for the second, eight for the third, and seven for the fourth. So whatever that product is, gives you the number of Virginia license plate which with no repetition. Okay, let's get rid of this example and we'll do another one. For our next example, we're gonna count up how many three digit numbers contain exactly one three. So this is gonna break into three sort of logical cases. The first case is if you have a leading three. So that means this number will be in the 300s. It'll be three and then something, something. I'll just denote those as stars. Or we could have the three in the tens spot. So that would be like star, three, star, like that. So like maybe 143 would be an example here. 
or we could have the three in the ones spot. So that would be like star, star three. So that would be like 173 or 953. That would be an example of something down here. So, and since we want exactly one three, then that means these stars are never equal to three because that would give us two threes in, in these expansions. Okay, so let's count up each of these types. So looking at this first type, we see that this star can be anything between zero and nine, but not including three. So that means there's nine choices for this tens spot. And similarly, there are nine choices for the ones spot. It can be zero through nine, but not including three because of this exactly one three condition. Okay. Now next, we can look at this. So this leading term cannot be zero because that would be a two digit number. So this can be one through nine, not including three. So that's only eight choices. But then in the ones digit, we also have eight choices or nine choices, I should say. And then this is exactly similar to the one above. So here we get eight times nine choices for that as well. So eight choices for the hundred spot and nine choices for the tens spot. So let's see what we get here. This is gonna be 81 and then two copies of 72. So we get 81 plus 72 plus 72. So let's see what that is. That's 144 plus 81. That's gonna be 225. So there are 225 total numbers that are three digits and have exactly one three. Okay, let's clean this up and then we'll look at the number of subsets. So we just got done counting lists or sequences of objects. Now we wanna count subsets of finite sets. So we're gonna do this via the following theorem and then some follow-up examples. So let's say n and k are integers and the number n choose k, which is sometimes called a binomial coefficient or written like this, but we always say n choose k, can be equivalently defined three different ways. And we'll prove that one of these follows from the other, but the last way we'll save for later. So first of all, we can define n choose k as the number of k element subsets of an n element set. So say you've got the set containing the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you wanna find out how many three element subsets there are. Well, there are going to be seven choose three. So you could give some examples of such subsets like one, two, three, or one, two, seven, or four, six, seven. But in order to calculate how many there are, you need to calculate this binomial coefficient seven choose three. Okay, next, n choose k can be arithmetically defined as follows. So it's this descending product in the numerator, n times n minus one, all the way down to n minus k plus one over k factorial. Or if n is a positive integer, you can also write this as n factorial divided by k factorial and then n minus k factorial. And I wanna point out here that if k is bigger than n, then n choose k is equal to zero. And that follows from this first equality, because notice you would pass through zero in the numerator there. That makes this version of the binomial coefficient kind of better than this version right here. Also, that follows from this up here because there are no k element subsets of an n element set if k is bigger than n. You cannot, for example, have 18 element subset of a seven element set. Okay, the next th way that we can think about this is n choose k is the coefficient of a to the k times b to the n minus k in the binomial expansion of a plus b to the n. Okay, so we're gonna start just by going from here, this k element subset idea, to this arithmetic idea. Okay, good. So let's suppose that S1, S2, all the way up to S n choose k are all of the k element subsets of 
an n element set, which we might as well just use the set one to n to be our n element set. Now next, we want to convert each of these subsets to lists and then reorder them as many ways as possible. And notice each of these subsets has k elements. So they have k factorial reorderings. So let's do a little calculation to motivate that over here. So let's say we've got our subset one, two, three. So it's fairly simple. And we wanna convert that into all possible lists. So the possible lists will be one, two, three, and then one, three, two, and then two, one, three, uh, two, three, one, and then finally three, one, two, and three, two, one. So notice we've got one, two, three, four, five, six possible sets. In other words, that's three factorial total possibilities, which makes sense because once we start reordering these into lists, we have three choices for the first entry, two for the second, and then one for the third, three times two times one. So let's maybe go ahead and write that down. So each subset has k factorial total reorderings into different lists. Great. Now next what I want to do is put this into an array. So I'm going to put this into an array like this. So we'll have S1, S2, all the way up to S in choose K. And then I'm going to superscript by which reordering this is. So the initial ordering will just be superscripted with a one. And then the last reordering will be superscripted with a k factorial because there are k factorial such reorderings. This goes all the way down here, s n choose k superscripted k factorial. So we've got this nice array that has a height of k factorial and then it has this length right here of n choose k. Okay. But now notice that we can count the number of lists in here two different ways. So first of all, via multiplication, we have that there are k factorial times n choose k total lists in here. But then by the multiplication principle, we want to look for all k element lists built out of n elements, where each entry from the list is distinct. So notice if we're building a k element list, well then the first entry would have n choices, the second entry, entry would have n minus one choices, all the way down the kth entry would have n minus k plus one choices. But now notice we can divide both sides of this equation by k factorial, and we have arrived at this second arithmetic definition of the binomial coefficient. Okay, good. So let's maybe go ahead and clean up this proof and then we'll do some examples. So it's pretty common to build our examples out of card games because it's something familiar to a lot of people. So we're gonna count up how many six card cribbage hands there are. So Cribbage is a card game, you get six cards, and then you discard two into something called the crib. Doesn't really matter what the rules are, but notice that the order doesn't matter of which cards you get. You could get an ace first and a king second. That would be the same thing as getting the king first and the ace second. So that means we're looking for the total number of six element subsets of a 52 element set. That's because there's 52 cards in a deck. So that tells us exactly what the answer is immediately. So there are 52 choose six total hands. Again, there are going to be this many six element subsets of a 52 element set, but that's exactly what this question is asking. So we could write this out. This is 52 times 51 times 50 times 49 times 48 times 47. So notice we've got this descending product of six terms in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we have six factorial. So let's write that as six times five times four times three times two times one. And I only do that so we can simplify that maybe as easily as possible. So let's go ahead and see what we can do here. So six divides into 48 
eight times. So we can cancel this six and the 48 to give us eight here. Okay, so that's nice. We can take this five, cancel it with this 50 and give us 10 here. Okay, let's see, we can take this four and cancel this 52 to give us a 13. Okay, and then maybe we could take this three and cancel this 51, and let's see, that's gonna give us 17. And then finally, we could take this two and cancel this eight down to a four. So we've still got some numbers to multiply up, but they're a lot less hard to multiply. So we have 49 times 47 times 17 times 13 times 10 times four. So I won't multiply those out, but that's how many six card cribbage hands there are. Okay, let's clean up the board and we'll do one more example. Let's finish this off with two examples that are built off of this third way of defining the binomial coefficient as the coefficient of a to the k, b to the n minus k in the binomial expansion of a plus b to the n. So again, this is something we'll prove later, but it is equivalent to the following above definitions. So we want to evaluate the sum of the binomial coefficients n choose k as k goes from 0 to n. So in other words, n choose 0 plus n choose 1 plus n choose 2 and so on and so forth. We're going to do that, like I said, using this third dot. So we can see that this is going to be the same thing as the sum as k goes from 0 to n of n choose k and then a to the k, b to the n minus k if we've evaluated a at one and b at one. So essentially we're just multiplying this by one to the k and one to the n minus k. But now we can take this and rewrite it as a plus b to the n where we've evaluated again a at one and b at one. So just to reiterate, we've taken this expansion which is really the definition of the binomial coefficient and replaced it with the unexpanded binomial. Okay, but now we just evaluate that at a equals one, b equals one, and we see that we immediately get two to the n. And we're done with that. So now let's see what we have here. Well, this is almost exactly the same. It's just now a is equal to negative two and b is equal to one. So let's see, we've got this is the sum as k goes from zero to n, n choose k. We have a to the k and then b to the n minus k. And like I said, a is being evaluated at negative two and b is being evaluated at one in this case. Okay, so let's see, that's gonna give us a plus b to the n where we've evaluated a at negative two and b at one. But it's not too hard to see that negative two plus one is negative one. So this is gonna be equal to negative one to the n. So this is equal to negative one if n is odd and one if n is even. And that's a good place to stop.